Every Palestinian who lives inside Israel as a citizen knows that they are on probation. Their existence in the state is conditional. For instance, when they demonstrated in support of the Second Intifada, the Israeli government decided that the police can stop such demonstrations with shoot-to-kill policy. Uh, in, the, in the 64 years of Israel existence, 500 new Jewish settlements inside Israel were built. Not even one Palestinian village was allowed to, to be built. And sometimes in life you have to make a choice. And you have to ask yourself, what would you like your children to be in the future? Citizens of a democratic, free state, or citizens of an apartheid Jewish state. These are the only two options. Professor Pape Ilan has paid a significant personal price for his commitment to truth and justice. The management, as I mentioned at his university, undertook a process of persecution that was aimed at expelling him from his position. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pape. Thank you all for attending this lecture. I want to thank the organizers. I know it took some effort and persuasion, uh, and finally I'm here. This is my first talk, uh, so it still be, the impact of the jet lag will probably still be recognized, hopefully not for too long. What I would like to do is to talk about one of my latest books, which uh, is called The Forgotten Palestinians. And uh, through that concept of the forgotten Palestinians, hopefully say something more general about the situation in Israel and Palestine. Uh, needless to say, of course, uh, as the discussion would be opened up, I would be very happy to engage in a conversation not only about the particular topic I'm talking about, but on Israel and Palestine uh, in general. In the uh, mid-1950s, David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, uh, was out of office for a short year and a half uh, due to internal political struggles within the then hegemonic dominant Labour Party and uh, the position of Prime Minister was in the hands of <coughs> Moshe Sharet, who most of the time was the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But just for a year and a half before the Sinai campaign, he was the Prime Minister, and Ben-Gurion uh, went to voluntary exile in his kibbutz in the Negev, De Boker, and had more time, as he wrote in his diary, to go around the country and see the people, uh, which when you are as a Prime Minister, I suppose you have less time to do. And one of uh, his tours in, those, in that moment of political lull uh, was uh, one of these trips was to the north of Israel, to the Galilee. And he so he visited uh, a military compound, a high school, a new factory, several kibbutzim. And all in all, it seems, at least according to the diary, that the day was quite satisfactory. But one thing clouded the day, one thing made the day not such a pleasant date, he wrote. There were too many Arabs in the Galilee. He didn't realize that. And I think that is very important because uh, Ben-Gurion as a prime minister, of course, was engaged with the question of Arab-Jewish relationship in the newly born state. But there is a difference between seeing something as a living experience and conceptualizing an issue as part of a strategy. So as part of a strategy, he knew that a very small number of Palestinians all in all remained in the Jewish state after 1948. But then concentrating in the trip in the Galilee, which was one of the few areas in Palestine where relatively the number of Palestinians was still high in the 1950s, he saw for the first time the incomplete result of what I called in one of my earlier books, the ethnic cleansing uh, of Palestine. 
And uh, he found it troublesome because Ben-Gurion in the mid-1950s believed that those Palestinians he has seen in the Galilee were a fifth column, were potential traitors, potential collaborators with the enemy. And uh, this led him to take two strategic decisions which he will implement when he will come back as a prime minister in uh, the early months of 1956. The first was not to let off the military regime that was imposed on the Palestinians in Israel immediately after the 1948 war, because quite a few people, including his nemesis, Menachem Begin, the leader of the right-wing Herut party, strongly so, uh, advised the prime minister to abolish the military rule. He said it doesn't stand to reason that so many citizens of a state would be under a military rule, and definitely people on the left asked him to abolish it. But after trips like this to the Galilee, he was sure it would be a fatal mistake not to continue a very ruthless and callous military rule in the Palestinian areas within the State of Israel. So that was one strategic decision. And only after he would leave politics altogether in the mid-1960s will the military rule on the Palestinians in Israel come to an end. You really needed to move, remove Ben-Gurion from politics to abolish that uh, military rule. And I'll come back to the military rule uh, in a moment. The second strategic decision he made was that um, the Galilee, especially the Galilee, needed to be Judaized. He there and then conceived, I think, the idea which became later on a governmental policy of uh, initiating a project which is called the Judaization of the Galilee. All kinds of red lights blinking here. I hope it's not the Israeli Secret Service or something. <laughs> but uh, is, this, is this significant or not? You don't think so? Okay, okay. I had a traumatic lecture tour in America where uh, all kinds of Zionist activists used all kinds of tactics to try and disrupt talks. So I thought maybe this was something like this. Anyway. Um, the uh, Judaization uh, uh, of the Galilee was not just uh, a theoretical concept. He immediately uh, set up a, a committee, and a very important person that committee is the present-day president of Israel, Shimon Peres, uh, how to make sure that the demographic balance in the Galilee would be dramatically shifted. The numbers he had in the 1950s were very alarming. And that's what led him, I think, to write in his diary there were too many Arabs. It was not just a kind of an intuitive impression that the Galilee is full of Arabs. And not only that the landscape, and indeed the landscape of the Galilee then looked more like an Arab area with the Palestinian villages and so on compared to many other parts of what used to be Palestine and became the state of Israel. But demographically, uh, in the 50s, 50% 50 of, the, of the people in the Galilee were Palestinians. And uh, he found that almost suicidal. And then he decided uh, uh, to set up this committee in which Shimon Peres was a particularly important figure. And their plan, which he approved, was to build intensively Jewish settlements uh, all around the major Palestinian villages and towns in the Galilee. And to build them in a way that would disrupt, as they called it, natural continuity between the Palestinian habitats. Uh, the worst uh, kind of threat in their eyes was the only Palestinian town, uh, Nazareth. Uh, which was a very small town during the mandatory period. The reason it became such a relatively huge place was because it hosted most of the refugees from the Palestinian villages around it. 
and it tripled in number compared to what it used to be in the mandate. And one of the first initiative was to build Upper Nazareth, a, 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 an urban sprawl that was meant to strangulate the Palestinian city of Nazareth and to make sure that it does not expand in any geographical way, which it didn't until today. Uh, the number of people in Nazareth tripled since 1948, but the space remained the same. Um, and uh, that somehow these two strategic decisions to uh, continue military rule in the, those areas and uh, to Judaize the Galilee, on the other hand, set the Ben-Gurion's mind to rest. The end of this story is, of course, that if you form today the first uh, Jewish town within the project of Judaization, that is Upper Nazareth, if you form the municipality there and you ask them how many Palestinians reside in this town, which is supposed to be purely Jewish, ideologically and strategically, they would say none. And then you would say to them, but you know, I'm, I've just toured Upper Nazareth and I've seen quite a lot of Palestinians. Uh, and then they would say, all right, but we're not at liberty to depart with such information. And the information is that almost 30% of the people who live in that town, which was meant to strangulate the Palestinian town of Nazareth, 30% of the people who live there are Palestinians. So uh, I think that if Ben Gurion would have been alive today and made another tour to the Galilee, it would have been even more awful than that trip back in the 1950s. The situation of the Palestinians inside Israel is important not because they are forgotten. So I thought it was good to write a book about a particular Palestinian community that is usually excluded from the political and historical agenda of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. That was good enough reason by itself to focus on that community. But there was another reason. I think that it is exactly the kind of attitude that Israel developed throughout the years as an official uh, organization, the, the state and the society alike. The kind of attitudes that develop towards the Palestinian minority inside Israel are a very good indication why it is so difficult for us, even those of us who are long-time activists and definitely those of us who are students of the topic for so many years, why is it so difficult either to provide a clear definition of the nature of Israel, or even if we are convinced that we know the answer, whether we use apartheid or settler colonialist state or whatever we use, or even democratic state, if uh, some of us still do that, why it's so difficult to convince others to adapt our definitions. And one of the main reasons for this uh, fluency in the definition is the relationship between the state and the Palestinian uh, minority. Because they are treated much better than any other Palestinian group. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and yet they live under very unique circumstances that actually prove, at least in my eyes and the eyes of many other critical observers, that, uh, that defining Israel as a democracy would be uh, uh, wrong if one takes the case study of the Palestinian minority as a litmus test, as a test for this assumption. Because most people would say, yes, because Israel occupies the West Bank, it cannot be defined as a democracy. But I'm saying no, it's exactly because, uh, I, I, not only because of the occupation, it is because of the way the Palestinian minority is treated that we should have questions uh, about and challenge the assumption that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. And of course, defining Israel as the only democracy in the Middle East 
is the basis for the Western and American, especially American support for, for Israel, and is the main immunity shield that allows Israel to pursue its policies uh, comparatively without any official pressure and, uh, and criti criticism uh, from the political and economic elites of the West. So the best way to examine the very unique circumstances in which the Palestinian minority in Israel lives is just to do a, small, a short tour into the past to understand uh, how the current reality in which they live uh, uh, materialized. And I think a lot from that history can be, uh, a lot of what we can learn from that history uh, it can help us understand better the reality uh, today. And it really connects to many questions that I know trouble us uh, as a community of activists. For example, the question of a one-state or a two-state solution is closely connected to the, the fate and the future of the Palestinian minority in Israel. What kind of Israel would be there should there ever be uh, a peaceful solution is also connected to, to that question. But far more profound questions are also, hopefully, will uh, uh, come out from such an historical journey. For instance, whether Israel is a Western European entity in the midst of the Arab world, or should it be part of the Arab world, part of its problems and part of its solutions. And much of what the Palestinians in Israel have to offer has, uh, gives you an idea of where can it go from here. Uh, because for the present, what we have is, of course, an Israeli Jewish political, intellectual, and cultural elite that wishes to maintain the Zionist dream of creating a kind of a central European republic in the midst of the Arab world. Uh, most uh, Israeli Jews still have this dream of an earthquake that would take Israel away from the Middle East <laughs> and append it to, hopefully, to Norway, but if it's not possible, <laughs> if it's not possible, at least to Italy. I think they will, they will, they will be content with Malta, but, <laughs> but I'm not sure about that. And this is the kind of uh, uh, reality which they could have faced better had they had a different kind of relationship with the Palestinian minority inside uh, uh, Israel. So uh, let me just do the, the brief historical uh, uh, journey and, and hopefully these two or three main themes that I mentioned, the one state, the two states, Israel, cultural uh, 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 identity, and uh, the question of democracy. I hope these three issues at least will come out very clearly. As probably m most of you know, what we, when we talk about the Palestinians in Israel, we talk about uh, the group that uh, was left intact, in a way, uh, inside what became the State of Israel. It's important to remind ourselves that the State of Israel was founded on 80% on of what used to be mandatory Palestine, 80%. And in that 80%, uh, about a million Palestinians lived. Out of the one million Palestinians, uh, only 100,000 or so remained. So first of all, we're talking here about a group of people who lost within few months 90% of their own community. And uh, one can only imagine, unless one went through it personally, I can only imagine the trauma of such a dramatic transformation in one's life. Now, it was not just losing your community, it was, of course, uh, uh, witnessing uh, how the landscape changed from being Mediterranean, if you want, Arab, in certain places Islamic, and how it suddenly transforms into a kind of a modern version of settler colonialist communities around you. Uh, at least a quarter of these people were refugees in their own homeland. They were expelled from their villages and towns, 
but uh, did not, were not expelled outside the boundaries of the newly formed Jewish state. Now, one has to understand that being a refugee then within the state of Israel meant watching very closely how your former house, your former field, your former shop is being taken by others and being uh, rebuilt uh, as a Jewish settlement or as a Jewish factory or as a Jewish uh, farmland. And uh, sometimes probably for a refugee to see this is far more traumatic and painful than living in exile somewhere, not knowing exactly what happened to uh, the land or the house uh, or the business which used to be yours. Um, uh, one, there are several poignant cases, but I particularly think of one particular neighborhood in Nazareth, uh, which uh, uh, was built after 1948, was not built actually, was re-inhabited by a new people because those people who lived there originally were expelled. And they re-inhabited a new, uh, a, a, an old neighborhood uh, that was exactly above the, vi the village that was uh, uh, occupied in 1948, destroyed, and rebuilt as a Jewish uh, uh, settlement with an old Hebrew name. And of course, the first thing you do in Israel of the 1950, you bring the archaeologist. Uh, and the first uh, uh, piece of clay that they find is enough to uh, convince everyone that there is a, an eternal scientific proof that this used to be a biblical town and therefore actually this was not expulsion and ethnic cleansing, this was a redemption or, re uh, or redeeming an ancient uh, uh, place. The place I'm thinking about is Tipori uh, and the, the, the name of the village is Safuria and the name of the neighborhood that uh, uh, overlooks uh, Saf uh, Safuria is called Safafra. So you can see, even if you are not speaking Hebrew or Arabic, how these names are, all four names are connected. Um, but uh, the traumatic uh, uh, experience watching your uh, houses and uh, real estate and whatever was in it looted and taken by others was not, of course, the only uh, uh, difficult aspect of being a Palestinian in Israel in the first 20 years of statehood. The most difficult one was to be subjected to the military rule, which I've mentioned before. Now, the military rule is an interesting uh, outfit because it was devised by the British in the 1940s. These were actually mandatory, British mandatory emergency regulations, which the British imposed mainly against uh, the uh, Jewish undergrounds in the 1940s. In fact, uh, some of the Israeli politicians who imposed these regulations on the Palestinians in Israel called them in the 1940s or resembled them in the 1940s to the Nuremberg Laws of 1930s. But somehow this comparison lost, it was lost in, uh, in history when they were reimposed on Arabs. When they are imposed on Jews, they are Nuremberg law. When they are imposed on Arabs, there are safety measures. And uh, in sh you, those of you who have been to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip don't have to use much imagination in order to uh, realize what the security regulations were all about. They are the same uh, features of military rule that are being experienced by Palestinians in the West Bank today, which gives any junior officer in the army absolute control of the civilian life. The soldiers are the judges, they are the executive, they are the legislative, and they have absolute control in your life. Uh, I do think that the military rule of the Palestinians inside Israel was worse than the military occupation of today because the, uh, uh, the military uh, uh, rule or the apparatus of the military rule uh, 
in the 1950s and the 1960s was manned by mm, soldiers who were very much on the margins of the Jewish society. Uh, everybody who was not considered to be useful to the Israeli army in any other mean was sent to govern a Palestinian community. Uh, so they were quite depressed people and they vented their frustration on the Palestinian uh, uh, community in, in ways that are uh, uh, very uh, cruel, but also sometimes very bizarre. And those of you who have read, because I know it was translated into English, the lovely uh, novel by the late uh, uh, Palestinian-Israeli author, Emil Habibi, uh, the optimist can have a humorous uh, view on that particular life. Uh, uh, but uh, even with his humor, the, the pain comes uh, through. Um, one of the most uh, uh, ultimate kind of uh, use of force under such circumstances was a massacre in 1956 in Kafar Qasim, uh, where 49 people were massacred by the, these kind of soldiers. Uh, uh, but this was just the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, uh, on a daily uh, basis, human rights and civil rights of these Palestinians were violated uh, within Israel that already then was depicted in the West as the only democracy uh, in the Middle East. I, s I noted before that this kind of military rule which I describe in, in my book, The Forgotten Palestinians, of course, in more detail, and I'm not the only one. There are even several good personal memoirs who've just come out lately that gives, uh, give an in-depth into that uh, uh, period. I, I mentioned that this period in the life of the Palestinians in Israel came to an end when David Ben-Gurion was no more uh, in, uh, in power, and, and that's true. But there was another reason why military rule in Israel and Palestine, in Israel, uh, ended in 1966. There was another reason. And the reason was that uh, contrary to the conventional, conventional history of the June 67 war that sees it as an event that sort of springs out of the blue, the, the common narrative of the 67 war is of uh, an Egyptian leader, Jamal Abdel Nasser, who uh, tries to uh, create a new coalition of radical Arab forces uh, whose one of their aims is to destroy the Jewish state and Israel uh, has to preempt his attempt to eliminate the Jewish state in June 1967 uh, and miraculously the Israeli army defeats uh, six or seven, I don't remember, uh, Arab armies and, and so on. I'm sure you're familiar with the if not, you can ring the Israeli embassy 24 hours a day. <laughs> I'm sure they will give you uh, a bite sound that would satisfy you. <laughs> well, it's part of the story. I'm not saying that this is totally false, describing it in such a way. But another part of the story, which is very important, is that the Jewish leadership was very much uh, uh, disappointed from not occupying the West Bank in 1948 when it had an historical opportunity to do so. And ever since 1948 was looking for uh, a pretext to occupy the West Bank. And it was very clear, uh, and now that the documents are open it's even clearer, that in, the in 1966 it was, it was in the air that such uh, an eventuality is about to happen. Nobody knew exactly whether it would be June 67. Nobody knew exactly that Nasser would do what he did. But there was a, a, a preparation ever since the mid-1960s in Israel to the eventuality of occupying the West Bank. Uh, and there was also already a strategic plan ready. That's why the Israelis so quickly uh, uh, I always was amazed by it. I was already then witnessing it with my, my, my own eyes, how quickly the Israelis were controlling the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, the, the, the answer is they were ready for it about three or four years uh, earlier. But what, what was important, that the, in order to envisage the possibility 
of what you do after you occupy the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, you had to envisage what kind of mechanism will you use to control it. And it was very clear that what you needed was to transfer the military rule imposed on the Palestinians inside Israel and use it for controlling a, a new group of Palestinians, namely those of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And most of the people who were uh, uh, in high positions in the military rule that controlled the lives of the Palestinians inside Israel would be the first to operate the same military rule with the same emergency regulations in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip immediately after the end of the June 1967 uh, war. So the military rule comes to an end when it's clear that another group of Palestinians is about to be under uh, Israeli control, because this is the history of Zionism. It has a demographic dimension, and it has a geographical dimension. It needs a successful Jewish project, or Zionist project in Palestine, is about space. How much of Palestine do you need to exist? And how many Palestinians inside that space can you tolerate to exist? Now, the more space you want, the more Palestinians you have. The less space you have, the less secure you feel. I'm not testing now whether these are good assumptions or bad assumptions. They're just uh, part of the Zionist catechism. And th this being Sunday and the opening of the Jewish New Year, I thought it would be good to be a bit religious. <laughs> and um, so it was clear they are going to take more land with many more Palestinians in it. And they needed to know how to control it. So in a way, the Palestinians in Israel benefited from the new strategy to expand the borders and to digest uh, an additional number of Palestinians as part of the citizens, as part of Israel's domain. Then the Palestinians in Israel became a topic for strategic discussion among Israeli politicians of how to proceed without the military rule. Because the military rule is a very clear tool. How do you control a quarter of your population whom you suspect of being a fifth column who you don't regard as an internal, as an integral or organic part of your nation, and uh, whom you really would like to see disappear. And yet, at the same time, and this is also genuine, at the same time, you do wish to be a democracy. You do wish to be a democracy. Uh, you do wish to be humane in your treatment. And even if you don't have these two impulses to be democratic and humane, you want to be seen as such uh, for the sake of getting American aid and diplomatic support from Australia all the way up to Washington. And, um, and, and that, that's a problem. I mean, that's, that's a big problem. Now, one thing is very clear, the basic attitude between, uh, of the state and the society, unfortunately, at large, to the Palestinian minority in Israel has not changed. And uh, there's so many surveys and censuses that are being conducted on a yearly basis, sometimes on a bi monthly basis, that show that this has not changed. For the vast majority of Jews in Israel, and for the vast majority of those who are at the center of policy making in Israel, the Palestinians of Israel are an existential problem. And the best solution would have been if they wouldn't have been there, but it's impossible, of course, to achieve that. So this kind of tension between what you want and what you can do is very uh, indicative. What also comes uh, uh, clear is that the Israeli policymaker, legislators, academics, security people uh, think that the best way to go along with this dilemma is to 
work all the time on two levels. One is the potential level, and one is the actual level. The potential level says that in the value system of the state, its existence uh, dwarfs any other value. Namely, if at any given moment, any kind of development in the relationship between the state and the Palestinian minority would endanger the existence of the state in the eyes of its policy makers, then every means is justified, including the ethnic cleansing of that population. And this was st uh, clearly stated uh, even by uh, Netanyahu uh, in this famous Herzliya conferences we have in Israel. These are Herzliya is a kind of uh, old people's home for university professors who don't know how to retire. So they build the private university for them. And, uh, but they're very prestigious, and they get all the people in the land to come and give them speeches about uh, their programs. And they talk there about the Palestinians in Israel as a demographic bomb or demographic problem. The, edu the, the noun changes, but the message is the same over the years. So potentially, every Palestinian who lives inside Israel as a citizen knows that they are on probation. Their existence in the state is conditional. Not so much based on their behavior, but how their behavior would be perceived by the authority. For instance, when they demonstrated in support of the Second Intifada, the Israeli government decided that the police can stop such demonstrations with shoot-to-kill policy. 13 Palestinian citizens paid with their life and it worked. Since then, you don't have massive Palestinian demonstrations. But of course, they can erupt again. But this was a red line. You, you cannot uh, demonstrate uh, on such a level and, anymore. Uh, and, and there are all kinds of other issues. I don't have the time to go into it, but maybe in the Q&A session we can expand on it. But I, I want you to understand that this is the kind of trick that Israelis plays, what I call the potential reality. The in, in the potential reality, the Palestinian citizens of Israel have no citizenship, have no basic human and civil rights. Uh, but in real life, they do. They do. But it, uh, it, it can take between one minute and ten seconds, or ten seconds to one minute, to change from one situation to the other, because the military regulations of Israel are still intact. And according to the military regulations, any military officer at any given moment can declare an area where Palestinian <coughs> citizens live as a military zone. And the moment it's a military zone, all their basic human rights and civil rights are gone. It doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen very often. But it's, it's possible to do that. So we are left with the real life of being a Palestinian in Israel, not the potential threat, but of course one cannot separate the two. On three levels, uh, Palestinians in Israel are, cannot be regarded as full citizens. And the, their abs this absence of full citizenship is indicative to all the three questions I raised before about Israel being a democracy, the one state, two state solution, and the cultural identity of Israel. On the legal basis, Israel uh, has a set of laws that directly discriminate the Palestinians in Israel uh, in any aspect of life. Now, this was not very apparent until about 15 years ago. In fact, the, the official legal discrimination was not very uh, uh, visible. For some reason, and again, I don't have the time to go into it, ever since 2000, there is a new intensity of legislation that totally uh, 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 made redundant any uh, effort by scholars to understand whether Israel is an apartheid state or not. They, may, they probably knew about our predicament and decided to start legislating in such a manner that forces me to burn some of my previous books and, uh, and my previous articles. There's no need anymore for any elaborate kind of deconstruction. No, we don't need Michel Foucault anymore for understanding why Israel is an apartheid state. Um, 
the uh, less visible uh, uh, aspects are in the executive, if one can put it this way, the way that budgets are distributed, uh, uh, kind of uh, all kinds of social privileges, uh, development plans. Uh, I've already mentioned the fact that uh, Nazareth cannot expand, but this is true about any Palestinian area. Uh, uh, in, the, in the 64 years of Israel existence, 500 new Jewish settlements inside Israel were built. Not even one Palestinian village was allowed to, to be built, let alone expand. Um, but there's a similar discrimination in, in school budgets, health education, and so on. The trick, before the legislation made it clear, the trick was to connect this kind of government assistance in building or developing an infrastructure to service in the army. It said that if you serve in the army, you are entitled to all these things. And because the Palestinians do not serve in the army, that's why they are discriminated against. Not because they are Palestinians. But it's not true because also the ultra-Orthodox don't serve in the army. And rather than being discriminated in budgets, they are overcompensated in, in budgets. So uh, that doesn't work that well. And the few Palestinians who do serve in the army, like the Druze and the Bedouins, cannot testify that such an agreement brought any uh, uh, improvement in their uh, living conditions uh, either. So that doesn't work. And then the third level is probably the most important level in, in many ways, is the, the, the invisible uh, ceilings and glass walls. And I don't think in this respect uh, the Palestinians fare differently from any minority group in any societies. But the interesting thing is, from a scholarly point of view, that the only literature you have in order to compare what Palestinians in Israel feel when they face a judge or a tax collector or the security person in, uh, in the airport, that the only literature we have is that of immigrants, especially immigrants of the last wave. But we have to rem remind ourselves that the Palestinians in Israel are not immigrants. The state immigrated into their life. They did not immigrate into uh, the state. And, and therefore, I think this is far more problematic in the kind of relationship that develops between the Palestinian minority in Israel. I would try to conclude here because I, I really want to open uh, the floor for, for as many comments and questions as, as possible by saying that in the Oslo process in 1993, 1993 two very important Palestinian groups were forgotten. The Palestinian refugees uh, and, the, and the exilic communities on the one hand, and the Palestinian minority in Israel. Because this is the basis of a two-state solution. It has to think of Palestine as being only 20% of Palestine, and it has to think about the Palestinians as being only 50% of the Palestinians. Now, there are many among us, some of them are very good friends of mine, uh, who believe that this is real politic, that you have to accept it, that the Palestinians are actually only those who live in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and that Palestine, what can you do, can only be these 20%, namely the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and you, will not, you won't have a solution if you don't uh, accept these two reductionist perceptions of what is Palestine and who are the Palestinians. But the Palestinians in Israel, like the refugees, will not disappear, even if you'll have a two-state solution tomorrow. And uh, I think that this is uh, the most important part of the story, that the predicament, the tensions, the violations, the inhumanity, the historical mistakes and atrocities that were triggered by a noble idea of Jews who wanted to save themselves by colonizing Palestine, that all these historical chapters would not be dealt with properly if we will continue to think that Palestine is only the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and if we will continue to exclude the Palestinian refugees and the Palestinians in Israel from a prospective uh, solution. It's almost like someone who has a disease all over his body and you tend to his uh, uh, hands 
or legs, and you say, yeah, I know the heart is not working too well, but until he dies, he will have good use of his two hands. Uh, that is not a solution. That, that in many ways, it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, a torture rather than a, a solution. Um, there, is no, there is no way of squaring circles. There cannot be a Jewish democratic state. There cannot be an Islamic democratic state. And there cannot be a Christian democratic state. There can be a democratic state. And if you, you may not think highly of democracy, and I won't blame you given what we've all experienced, but let's say that we are willing to settle for a democracy as a good political system, or the, less, the, the lesser of all evils. If the Palestinians in Israel and in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip and those who were refugees will not be entitled to equal civil and human rights, there will never be a democracy. However, you're going to partition the land and repartition it, or federate it or confederate it. You will have to go not to the geographical issue, but to the rights issue. And uh, the price for the Jewish community is going to be very high, undoubtedly. A democratic Israel will not be a Jewish state. That's true. So this is something that Israelis would have to come to terms, because all their attempts to square the circle by saying we'll be both Jewish and both democratic, the history of the Palestinians in Israel proves that it is not possible. And sometimes in life you have to make a choice. And you have to ask yourself, what would you like your children to be in the future? Citizens of a democratic free state or citizens of an apartheid Jewish state? These are the only two options. Thank you. Uh, on the one hand, you have a very clear public opinion that has dramatically moved in support of the Palestinian cause, especially among the young people, who now treat Palestine as probably those of us who were active as young people in the 60s uh, treated Vietnam, those who were active in the 70s treated uh, Chile, and those who were active in the 80s treated apartheid South Africa. I think Palestine became all these three case studies uh, uh, put together. And it, mainly it's, it's generic to something much bigger that troubles us. Sometimes, and this happened in apartheid South Africa as well, the very uh, last days of an oppressive r regime uh, are actually the cruelest and the most troublesome ones. And in, in many ways, sometimes in Israel you have this feeling that things are heading towards a moment of truth. And uh, that doesn't mean that the last bit of the trip uh, is going to be peaceful, on the contrary, because uh, a dramatic change means that a lot of people who have vested power and privilege are going to fight to death to keep it. And I think that's part of the cruelty you see around and the pessimism. So, so what, one way of looking at it is to, to, to understand that um, uh, in history, uh, sometimes a very bad period precedes a better one. And, uh, We've seen it in so many other cases, so one can at least draw some optimism from that.